Welcome to our latest installment of Beyond Distribution with GTDC podcast. From the computer science lab to executive roles with Fortune 100 companies, Cheryl Cook, Senior Vice President of Global Partner Marketing of Dell Technologies, understands the challenges and opportunities available in the IT industry. In this conversation with Frank Vitagliano, Cheryl shares her thoughts on how tech companies can be more inclusive, how AI will affect IT sales, and a range of other topics. Please remember that all of our other episodes are available on our Knowledge Hub at www.gtdc.org. Welcome, everybody. Uh, This is Frank Vitagliano, and we're uh, recording our next uh, edition of Beyond Distribution. And I am thrilled today to have uh, not only a good friend, uh, not only a mentor and former boss, but also um, an individual who's been very influential in the marketplace for a long time. And that's uh, Cheryl Cook, Senior Vice President, Global Partner Marketing from Dell. So Cheryl, thank you for joining. Hey, Frank, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is good. So, um, you know, Cheryl, you and I have been talking about doing this for a while. And finally, we we met at, at an event recently and decided to, we needed to get this done. So, I know. Uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Um, obviously you're really well known in the industry, but, um, I think it would be helpful for folks to kind of understand sort of, you know, your personal journey and kind of what got you to where you are today. How'd I get here? Right. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Well, you know, I'm a geek at heart, so I've been in the IT industry my whole career. And as you know, I'm a proud Florida Gator. and studied computer science in school. So I've probably touched different facets of the industry, but, you know, started in engineering, then in sales, now in marketing. And, you know, as the industry's evolved, I'm just passionate about staying customer and partner facing. So I've never been like in the BU or doing development roles, but it was always customer-centric, partner-centric, revenue-generating, but most importantly, it's problem-solving, you know? So the reason I just love this so much is, one, it's dynamic. The nature of our industry is forever innovating and evolving and changing. Um, But, you know, I'm a space brat. I grew up and my dad was in the Apollo program and was a huge influence on kind of what to pursue in school. I was like any other kid going into school, not sure what to do. I was good at math. And dad's like, hey, I think this computer thing is going to be a big deal. And the rest is history. So it's been a great run, a fabulous experience and, you know, all the bumps along the way. But, you know, I'm an eternal optimist and just look at how much we've seen. I sound like a bit of a dinosaur when I tell my kids. It's like, you know, when I started, we actually had a receptionist at the front taking messages on big slips and there wasn't voicemail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and then we evolved to checking out this big bag that they ended up calling a mobile phone. Exactly. You'd have three in the office. And if you were lucky enough to get one, you could use it for a day. And you had to check it out. Exactly. Right. You had to check it out to go make yeah. sales calls. Exactly. Yeah, isn't, that, isn't that funny? <laughs> um, you know, Cheryl, the, the thing that I found most interesting uh, is when we first met and I was working uh, for you at D- Dell, um, I was surprised at, at, you know, even though, you know, you said you've been in customer facing roles, you could pretty much go toe to toe with a lot of the geeks relative to the technology. <laughs> And that that surprised me. I you know I I wasn't prepared for that honestly. Um, and I know part of that is you've had you know background at at Sun uh, as well as two or three other companies before before Dell, right? Which yeah really helped yeah you know, right. Yeah, you know, it's true. I guess if we've been in the industry a long time, you know, I started at NCR, which in the day you were at IBM, right, was one of the big five. Yeah. And in those days, it was just end to end full stack computing, right? You had the whole operating environment and application and industry specific solutions. And I really kind of cut my teeth in the Unix era, which is how I ended up at Sun. And I probably am a geek at heart. You know, I haven't programmed in a long time, but I understand the technology Mm. and I'm inspired by it and I'm curious about it. And, 
you know, at every turn and every iteration and evolution of kind of just the way this industry has evolved, you just get higher orders of abstraction and people monetize the value and our partners, I know we're going to talk about this, position themselves to have to ever be evolving in, in those transitions on how they bring value and monetize it. So I love it, you know, and, yeah. you know, I, although I, I pride myself in kind of being able to keep up, I'm definitely not on the, the technical end anymore, but I still have to ask my kids for help with my cell phone. So <laughs> that's okay. The cell phone piece is okay, but yeah. So it's just sticking a little bit with the, the journey, particularly early on. So, you know, back then when you pursued that, you know, IT degree, if you would, uh, the technical degree, um, there weren't a lot of women probably in that space doing that, right? Um, and so clearly, you know, there were some obstacles that I'm sure you faced. Uh, there were some challenges just associated with that. And, you know, for someone like me who came out of IBM and, you know, was in the mainstream uh, you know, we didn't always see that. We didn't always recognize that, but I'm sure you you dealt with that. Yeah, you know, and I think, unfortunately, we're still dealing with it. We've made some great progress. Yep. And I think sometimes, you know, you just don't see the inhibitors or the barriers and, you know, until they show themselves. I've been extremely fortunate that I um, have had people that sponsored me and supported me. But, you know, when I went to college, I definitely was one of the only women in my classes, but I was one of those rare breeds that, you know, I'd go log in for my one hour timeshare in the engineering lab at the computer hall, but I was a sorority girl too. Yeah. So I'd have the sorority house to be able to kind of do my social side. And then I was pretty disciplined to kind of strike the right balance of, I can't do everything social because this is hard work. You know, yeah. I'm not going to lie. It was hard work to earn it. But through those investments, I think it gave me a great foundation of just one, it was something I enjoyed. And two, I was curious about it. But through all those examples, I could connect dots, right? With the technical conversation, a business conversation, resourcefulness on how do you find the right team and people to kind of help you just solve the problems. And I think at my heart, I'm competitive. I like winning. So, you know, whether you're in a sales capacity or marketing capacity, winning is how do you help the customer achieve their objective? But, you know, if you're on the supplier vendor side, how do you help make sure that it's a solution we, we can bring? So I've always been able to kind of find that in all yeah. the different polls I've done. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing about, and you mentioned that, you know, we've made strides, but we still have to work it, you know, and you and I were together recently at the Woman of the Channel event in in um, in New York City. Um, you know, for someone like me, who I came out of, as you mentioned, IBM, and, you know, we had this term, respect for the individual, and and we really thought we did all the right things as it related to diversity and bringing people along and et cetera. And so, you know, we didn't have different pay scales for women versus men or any of that, that, you know, people ask about, but yet when I look back at it, I also would tell you, we didn't do enough. Right. And the reason we didn't do enough is it wasn't conscious. It was sort of like, you know, well, whoever the best person for the job is, that'll get the job. And that's okay. When you're sort of in an environment where, you know, it's been, there's a level of diversity to start with. In the case of what I experienced, there wasn't. So I think you had to do more to position mm -hmm. women, to position minorities, to, to you know, help them along. Um, have you seen that and experienced that, you know, over the years? And what's your take on that? Absolutely. And I think, you know, the longer I was doing it, the more I didn't appreciate early how much you had to maybe have, you know, one and a half voices versus just one to be right. able to stand out and be viewed credible. You know, I think honestly, if, if you're looking at the rest of our male leadership, they didn't have a long list of candidates that would have been female to select from in the first place. 
Do they have confidence in taking a risk? You know, I mean, so it's on both sides, frankly. Yeah. And I think, you know, you're a good leader and you're a great example, Frank, of somebody that consciously made the choice to make the effort to create space yeah. for people. You have to give them the opportunity and you have to consciously promote, you know, go keep looking to find a couple other candidates so that we can at least give people opportunity. And I think, honestly, we need more of that. And so as I've gone longer, I began to appreciate and actually felt a little more of an obligation on having to give back. You know, I had somebody say once, if you can see her, you can be her. And I like that phrase because it's like just kind of in a very informal way, if you can just show examples of how you've done it. And as I've mentored women and as I've even spoken, you know, I don't shy away from being a girly girl. So I never felt like I had to put the blue suit on and I was, I did it my way, but you have to have acumen. You have to be competent. You have to be capable as long as you're confident in your abilities, let your performance, let your results, let that speak for themselves on the opportunities. But I, I've ever increasingly from then just created the space and tried to live by example on sometimes women don't see it in themselves. You, you know, you can see opportunity in them that they don't yet have the confidence for. And you have to just help kind of pull them along or give them the opportunity and they flourish, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned mentoring. And so, you know, I was there when, when we were working together, I watched um, what you did and the number of people that, you know, you mentored. And, and frankly, you've been recognized, you know, in the industry for it, um, you know, at that event that we were there together, you you won the award as the CRN Woman of the Year for Community Impact, right? Which is a big deal. Um, you know, in addition, last year was also a good year for you. You won the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, yeah. uh, from uh, the Channel uh, Futures Group, which was also very significant. Um, but, you know, and I know you feel this way. I've always felt this way. It's not the awards that really matter because at the end of the day, yeah, they look nice behind you on that, you know, on the show, yeah. but they, they don't, they're not meaningful. It's the relationships. And, and so I know you have this view that you should give back, but um, talk to me a little bit about the mentoring piece, because I know there's been a lot of women over the years that, you know, you've, you've helped, you've influenced uh, and men too, but um, how do you, how do you view the mentoring piece? So I think you know, honestly, it's a bit of a safe space, if the, if that's the right term. It's like, who's somebody you either admire or somebody you respect or somebody who's had experiences that you haven't yet had the opportunity to <clears throat> and foster a bit of a relationship where there are no dumb questions. You know, you can ask you know, whether they're business related questions or they're situational, you know, and it's just more social and it's just, I can relate to that, you know? And I think, you know, we talk about, you know, we're talking, I'm in my home office and what the pandemic did and working remote. And, you know, we can remember the days when heaven forbid, you'd be on a conference call and there was a dog barking. <laughs> now, we're on video conferencing and you have the baby and you want to meet the kids and you want to know the name of the dog. And we're just, I think it's revealed a bit of a humanitarian side that was sorely needed, <laughs> like, cause we're all humans. So I think in a mentoring capacity, it's, it's really that 360 view on how you can be authentic. You can be your best self. You can show up and conduct yourself in a unbashful way of just bringing your uniqueness to the situation. And I just happen to be a big believer that whether it's diversity of race, geography, gender, like whatever form diversity comes, it just creates a richness and we all get smarter. You just have different perspectives. And I'm just a people person by nature. So I like that. 
Yeah. And I've just seen it in action in teams where you can go faster and you can create just this cross pollination of thought and ideas and culture that just, you know, creates a better outcome, frankly. And yeah. experience. There's no question. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Uh, there's no question. I think one of the things you mentioned was sort of the combining of the, the business and the social piece. And yeah. I find that a lot of younger folks are a little uncomfortable in how they handle that, you know, because, and particularly now, because we're not in as many social engagements as we used to be, right? I mean, back in the day, you were in the office every day. You were bumping into people in the coffee room. You were bumping into people after work, you know, at, a, at you know, having a few drinks or whatever. And now it's a little different. And one of the things that I try to do when I talk to and mentor, you know, folks is... I try to put myself back in their seat at their time and think about what was I thinking about at you know, 22 when I was doing this or 32 or whatever, right? It's and, and it's it's no question. And I think, you know, even when I talk about, you know, what would I say to the 21-year-old version of Cheryl, right? If I could go back and, you know, talk through some of those things. But I think frankly you know, look at all the return to site and return to work business policies that all our companies are wrestling with right now. So you look at the industry at large, we're trying to find that equilibrium again of how do you not lose the invaluable, irreplaceable opportunity to connect and just observe people in action? Like there's no substitute for the interactions of people in a meeting, in a conference room, or the opportunity to just debrief a little at the side. And if you're young in your career, you just won't get that over Zoom. It doesn't mean it has to be binary and it's one or the other, but I, I think that's honestly what a lot of companies are trying to strike that right balance again is you want the flexibility. We've learned how productive people can be remotely, but there is a price. There is something that, you know, whether it's culture or whether it's learning on the job or if it's the informal mentorship or the observations that if you're young and career are just invaluable and irreplaceable. No question. I mean, I remember when I first went to Dell, uh, you know, probably the third day I'm down in the cafeteria and who walks through but Michael. Right. Exactly. And, exactly. and he's talking to people and he's shaking hands and he sits down at a table for a few minutes. And I'm thinking, whoa, what the heck? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, of course, as you know, we would do a bunch of briefings and there'd be various meetings and some he was formally engaged in, others he would pop in and he'd talk yeah. to customers. And it it's hard to get that in a, right. in a you know, but yet. Should we do it 100% every day of the week? It, you know, no. It, so I'm with you. I, I firmly believe there's a balance. Um, and I think the workers, my opinion, the right, the ones who are doing it properly can flourish with the combination of, yes. you know, high, the, a hybrid model of some sort, right? Well, and, you know, I mean, I work for Dell and we're a company that, you know, helps empower and enable the new future working environment, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're helping people with all that. And I think you're right. As we look at the innovations and the new capabilities and the technology, it's it's just striking that balance of of making sure we're creating and fostering those opportunities and those environments for our team members to be able to get the best of both. And I think right now, you know, you've got people on varying degrees of the spectrum on how happy they are about it or not. And I just, you know, I always encourage people to just kind of take a measured perspective. You know, things move fast in our industry. You look at kind of the, the shock and awe of how we got to remote overnight in a pandemic. And we're just kind of finding our way back to the right equilibrium to, you know, be productive, don't lose the culture, do right by our team members that are young in career and, you know, and be flexible. So, well, you know, we had our, um, it was really interesting. We had our event last week, the North America GTDC event, and we had a, an, an economist speak. 
And he talked about his view on, you know, why we've seemed to up to now avoid a recession. Things are going pretty well. And he talked about productivity. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, the thing that the thing that he kind of said, I can't quite put my finger on what's happened here and why we're seeing the productivity we're seeing. Now, again, this wasn't a business guy. He was a pure economist. Mm -hmm. The next speaker was Crawford Delpreet, Del the president of IDC. And he got up and he said, well, I agree, the productivity piece, but let me tell you what the productivity piece was. It was all the tools that you just, that Dell and, and your, your, uh, your peers and competitors have put in place to make us more productive, right? I mean, five years ago, six years ago, you and I doing this would have to be sitting in a room together with yeah. 14 people setting up cameras and putting makeup on us and all this other stuff. And now we get on a call for a half hour and, you know, we, we accomplish the same thing. And that's, yeah. I think, what's driven the productivity. You know? Well, and I think there's a human component to that. You know, the technology candidly has been there. You know, we had Skype. We had, yeah. I mean, Microsoft Teams has improved. We're on Zoom now. We had Zoom. And it forced a human adoption of change management to embrace these tools. Now yeah. we're more comfortable with them. Totally. So it's part of the whole, so it's, it's technology productivity, but it's also a shift in our willingness to embrace it. You know, so I think it's, it's all parts on a graph. I'm sure there's smart people somewhere grafting <laughs> adoption with productivity, with whatever, but there's a human element to this that, like I said, I think it's revealed a beautiful humanitarian side of us that was a little too stuffy unnecessarily before. So now it's like, how do you capture and retain the goodness yep. and then continue to lean in um, to be productive? And the pace things are moving right now, candidly, is kind of unavoidable. You're gonna have to be able to operate at the pace things are moving or you're gonna just get left behind. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. So, so let's move on for a minute, Cheryl, talk about, um, you, you know, sort of, the the world that you live in um and you know since i known you in 2013 you know you were a huge supporter of the channel from day one in fact at the time you were the global channel chief uh, at, at dell um so i know your go-to-market philosophy <laughs> i know what you think of it but it would be good to just chat a little bit about you know uh, how you feel about the role channels and distribution has played in you know, the world that you've lived in for a long time. Yeah, well, you know, when I tell people I'm really, I'm passionate about kind of just partnering and partners and channel because I describe it, I tell people it requires kind of three-dimensional thinking. You know, it's ultimately about the win-win-win of our customers, our partners, and whoever we work for, right, our, our vendor, whatever. But I think I always start with the customer. And when you look at what our industry delivers at various stages of integration of technology, customers are always wrestling with just the complexity, the choices, and they're trying to solve a business problem. And I think even throughout, you know, the evolutions of the technology we have, Partners are problem solvers. Partners give confidence to customers. They bring a degree of specialization and capability, but they're risk mitigators. They can help customers accelerate time to revenue for their problems. And then on the, on the vendor side, they give you a host of skills and expertise and scale. And offer. so it's just, to me, it was always a natural extension of you're going to have more opportunities at bat to win. I said I'm competitive and solve more customer problems when you have more resources that are solutioning and advising and consulting and recommending that include your solutions. But at the end of the day, it's always solving the customer problem. And I think if we always keep ourselves grounded there, it's a very objective way to keep everybody honest <laughs> on where's the demand opportunity? How can you help, you know, create space for the next opportunity? And whether it's 
enterprise data center, my days at Sun, where we had to cultivate a community of partners that were very deeply specialized in Solaris and understood deep skills, or even to Dell, you, you know, in an industry standard, we have high volume transactional client kind of business with those kind of skills and capabilities to data center, multi-cloud and AI and that whole continuum, partners are critical and can help you scale. And, you know, I'm, I've just believed that from the beginning, you know, my days at Sun, honestly. And then when I joined Dell, I joined Dell to kind of help the company expand in the data center and do more in the enterprise space and was a big believer and an advocate that the strength of the partner community was a key lever to help us do that. And it's now half the company's revenue. So yeah. it's been a key driver. Yeah. Totally. And you were from day one. Um, yeah. The other thing that happened that that really changed things a lot was when you joined and when I joined, Dell was primarily an endpoint device company, right? I mean, yeah. certainly server business that went into the infrastructure, but the purchase of the, the, the uh, acquisition of EMC really changed, you know, sort of the makeup of Dell's, you know, sort of set of solutions into the marketplace. Right. And, and that also, uh, I think, played well into the overall go-to-market strategy because, you know, that you needed those set of partners with that set of skills to help, you know, from a go-to-market standpoint. And I think that was very significant, right? Very significant. Well, a lot of that is credit to Michael and the leadership and vision and the strategy of the company. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when the two companies, EMC and Dell merged, I think that was, you know, just another pivotal opportunity, particularly from the partnering perspective, because, you know, many of these partners were big EMC partners and it was a cross-sell opportunity for them, which created growth opportunities. And it certainly helped grow Dell. And I think, you know, I've been so fortunate to have participated in one of the industry's biggest tech mergers that arguably exceeded all expectations on a successful yeah. merger and not all of them are successful and the partner ecosystem the community our go-to-market strategy our evolution of combining the two programs there's no doubt was a key enabler that helped the company's success but we helped a lot of growth in the partners too no question i think the uh, that what you just described and people don't understand the complexity associated with what you just said in those four sentences right <laughs> uh, but taking taking what was a very good you know dell program uh channel channel set of initiatives that were designed however for a different you know different sort of marketplace combining it with what emc was doing uh which was also a good program for those partners that were in it and the distributors that were in it and coming out with a seamless integrated one, which you know I hear nothing but good things about in the marketplace, um, was a monumental task. And it's going to be interesting because there's a lot of merger activity kind of going on in the industry now, and there are various people doing certain things, and we all know what we're talking about. But it'll be interesting to see how well that comes together because I think what you guys did at Dell with the EMC piece is probably going to be the the standard for how it ought to have worked. So it'll it'll be interesting how it plays out, you know. Yeah, you know, I you know, I will forever consider it, you know, and I tell a lot of my team members too. I mean, it's a fabulous industry. It's a unique opportunity. I believe a lot in timing, right? And you just look at the timing in the industry when we did that and how well positioned the company was. And to be fair, I, I just have, I think, you know, some of the best colleagues to work with in the industry. We came together pretty quickly and we were just like-minded. It was really complimentary. It wasn't competitive. It was, here's what we could do. And we all brought our strengths and perspectives. And I think, you know, I was the channel chief at Dell, but I have an enterprise background. Right. I used to work with EMC when I was at Sun. A lot of the partners that came into the Dell partner program were former Sun partners right. and they were EMC partners. So I think it just helped us go faster on getting to a 
unified set of what good looks like. And we both came from a place of really listening to our partners. So we did a lot of feedback sessions and you have to execute. So yeah. to the to the goodness of the company, it's been an amazing experience. Yeah. yeah you, you also you also were coming from a place that's really important in the partner community and that's trust. Yeah, mm -hmm. you guys were coming from a place of trust because you know, you know you've been de dealing with it a long time. Partners have very long memories. And, yes. and you know, if if there's been a positive scenario over the years and trust has been built, then you start with the benefit of the doubt. If there hasn't been, and there hasn't been, uh, you know, in situations where there hasn't been, you don't have the benefit of the doubt. So you guys had the benefit of the doubt, partly because of, you know, you being there and, and having experienced a lot of it, and it worked. So look, we're running out of time. I have one last question for you. Um, and I know it's on everybody's mind and, you know, we had a lot of discussion about it two weeks ago at our event. Um, and that's, you know, sort of the impact that we see AI about to have in the marketplace, right? And already has had. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah. certainly, certainly, you know, from your standpoint at Dell, whereas maybe, you know, last year for everybody, you know, the endpoint device market wasn't exciting, right? I mean, there was a lot of people struggling in that space because of what had happened previously. But we walked out of that event two weeks ago that we had with a lot of optimism relative to you know AI-enabled PCs and what what is is possible there. How are you feeling about that and and sort of the ongoing evolution of the technology? I think it's remarkable. You know, I told you, I kind of geek out a little bit on some of this stuff. And if there's one word I keep reusing with everyone is just the pace. Yeah. I mean, the pace with which this technology is disrupting and will disrupt every sector, every industry, every company to the good. Like, like it's gonna unlock and unleash just a whole nother generational um, move. And I think it's a partner centric motion inherently. Yep. None of us can do it alone. The sheer specialization and complexity to be able to really harness the potential of what all these insights and AI can do are going to create opportunity. I think there was a Canalis statistic that said they anticipate the AI opportunity for partners to be $158 billion by 2028. And I think the services opportunity, so it's gonna create a refresh opportunity for all of us that are in the traditional space. Forget, I mean, Windows 11 alone is gonna help us with a refresh, but this notion of, AI PCs software inherently is just going to run differently. We're going to have GBU centric servers as opposed to so this notion of security, AI ready, AI enablement, and at the end of the day, AI is only as good as your data. Yeah. And this notion of you know I think IDC predicts over half of the industry's data is going to be generated at the edge. So everything is moving use case centric, very vertically specialized. The true power and the value is in the more specialized you get, the more you can anticipate all of that is a partner led opportunity and partner led motion. So I personally think the TAM, the growth, the opportunity for our partners has probably never been stronger. And then you overlay that with the pace. Nobody can do it alone. And, and it's just going to be, we need everybody to just kind of bring their strengths and their best capabilities to market. And I think we're going to reveal, we're already seeing it, new partners, new businesses created. People are coming with new capabilities. So it's going to be amazing. Um, yeah just yeah. going to be buckle up. I, I mean, I, I've never seen anything move faster. <laughs> Literally. I agree. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's fun times. Um, yeah. I think people have to be patient and, and position themselves properly. Certainly, um, 
you and the Dell team are positioned extraordinarily well, uh, you know, to take advantage of it as it goes forward. And I completely agree with you about the channel. Uh, both the solution providers and the distributors are making major investments um, in, in order to, you know, enable and accelerate, uh, you know, the the opportunity. So it's good. Well, you know, Cheryl, it's funny. You and I could probably spend the next two hours talking, but. People wouldn't listen. After a while, they kind of tune out, I think. So we'd do it for ourselves, but, you know, that might, might, not be, might not be what they want to do. So this has been great. I really appreciate you taking the time and, uh, and uh, providing the benefit of, you know, your wisdom and experience. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you again in the very near future. Oh, absolutely. It's always good to be with you, my friend. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate it.